Welcome back, everybody, to these aren't the nerds you're looking for. Uh, Kevin Horde here. Lorenzo Fine over here. Lorenzo, what's up, man? We got another Resistance episode. Yeah, this, we're going, going on. So this is... So, um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> this is still uh, part of the first what I'm still calling three episodes that were released. Yes. Uh, all at once uh, on, I don't have the date now in front of me. <laughs> uh, seventh. This. Yes. It's, they were put on the Disney app on the seventh, but the official release date for the triple dark, which is uh, season one, episode two, which is what we're talking about today is October 14th. Yes. So, you know, we are, we got a sh- I watched them all at once. So I did not. I'm um, still going. I'm going one by one. Week so, by week. Yeah. That's probably for the best. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to make that note that for these first three episodes, if you uh, do want to watch them, they are all available on the Disney uh, Now app Correct. and stuff like that. So it's it's still officially airing on Disney Channel. Yep. Uh, October 14th. Uh, this recording will come out afterwards anyways. Uh, but, yeah, just wanted to make a note on that. Yeah, so I have an update to a question that I had last week, and mm-hmm. that is whether or not The Recruit is actually Episode 1 and Episode 2. And because it kind of depends on where you're getting your information as to what uh, what is being said about that. But yeah. what uh, what I have found out, along the way or what it looks like the the information that I'm leaning towards agreeing with is that the recruit is episode one and episode one only, but the, the production code for it is one Oh one and one Oh two. So uh-huh. it encompasses what were two episodes, but it is considered episode one. So, in that case, like this is season one, episode two, the triple dark, but the production code is one Oh three. Yeah. So they will be off one for the rest of the season. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. yep. We're just going with that. Uh, the recruit was a 44 minute and this is a 22 minute Um, also I've got, got, uh, I guess projected, Number of viewers for the recruit last week. I want you to take a guess where you think this this lies uh, as far as viewership goes. And I will give you the caveat of we know that probably the least viewed episode of the Clone Wars was like maybe one and a half million, one and a quarter million, and like the heaviest viewed is like three and a half ish, right? Uh, and I know it's a challenging question because viewership is different now than yeah, that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Media is way different, but and I don't know if this Again, includes like uh, in app, you know, views and all that shit. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's that was going to be my thing. Like the 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 landscape nowadays is so completely different. Um, I'm just going to go like solid mill, three hundred. You know. And thirty three thousand people. Jesus, yeah. I knew it still sounded too high. I was like, "Ooh, damn, third of a million? I don't know. That uh, there's no way that's counting these. I don't. But again, it's n- number one. It's Disney Channel Sunday night at ten fucking p.m. Right, and I feel like they would have a more accurate uh, viewership count using the app because that is all that information is going to be stored digitally like but here's here's the issue it's not no there are no advertisers right ratings are ratings are not a system for consumers to know anything about Uh uh-huh the ratings advertisers yeah interesting the ratings are there for advertising purposes Huh. So, like, the show isn't there to get people to watch. The show is there to break up commercials. If 
television producers could, they would just sit you down and have you watch 30 solid fucking minutes of commercials. Hmm. But humans don't do that. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to sound conspiracy theory or anything, but really, the way television works is to entertain you to some degree. Right. So that you don't turn away from the commercials. The advertising comes first, right? Like, Well, it used to. It doesn't anymore. Right, because the landscape is so different. So that's why, like, with these ratings, you know, for the longest while, they they wouldn't count, like, Hulu views or DVR views even Mm -hmm. weren't counted for a while. Hmm. They're counted now, depending on where you're getting your information, only because it's still kind of a number some people are curious about, right? Right. But really for for hearing the number 330,000 like that's that's like a straight to me seems like a straight uh like here's who watched it live on air because gotcha these are the numbers that we are beholden to to report to our advertisers yeah because that would only be like what 1% of the US population but again Disney Channel 10 p.m. that makes sense like right yeah. Like on a Sunday night. It's weird. Like, it's a weird like it's a weird yeah. fucking time. It's a weird time slot for sure. I was telling my my wife and my oldest daughter uh like the time slot and my daughter was like, Why would anybody be watching Disney Channel at ten o'clock on Sunday night? Right. Or like maybe at least if it was like Friday Friday night at ten. With the caveat that they were going to play it as, like, a Saturday morning cartoon. Right. But you can view it Friday night. Yeah. But, like, the premiere premiere showing is Friday night. Mm-hmm. Right? But, like, really, like, they're depending on that weekend. Yeah, like, I, I, don't, I don't fucking understand these executive decisions. But I, yeah, it's, I, I'm glad that they put the episode in app early for these three. I don't know what's going to happen when we catch up after next week's episode. Yeah. We'll have to, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Cause like these episodes might have to come out on Tuesday if we're only watching the episode on Monday. <laughs> you know? Very, then, very true. Very true. Right. And then recording the, the, uh, watch it reaction mm-hmm. on Monday. Yeah. Like we watch it, record reaction, then I got to do my thing to these episodes and Lorenzo does some magic. But uh, speaking of which, let's hop into this and, and um, yeah, we're going to do a speed run through. Yep. What happens here? Yep. You want, you want to take this one? I will take this one. Uh, we it. start with a wide view of the Colossus. We've got uh, some type of sheathapede esque like ship coming in uh, lands in a docking bay. We see, Jaeger directing the ship in. Kaz is unpacking his stuff uh, kind of while he talks to BB-8 about being a spy. Nico comes up and compliments his stuff and his belongings and whatever in his, in his Niku fashion. Uh, we're introduced to this lucky trophy that pops up several times throughout the um, Jaeger gives Kaz his first assignment, which is, like, fixing this dude's ship, uh, which plays semi-prominently in this episode. Um, oh, which, uh, before we go farther, uh, sure. because because this is a different format than our normal Clone Wars, mm-hmm. because this is a new episode, I this should be implicit in the episode, but spoiler warnings. Oh, yeah, for, my bad. <laughs> for the triple dark, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about just, that. Yeah, so just, you know, hey, we are going to discuss the entire episode. If that, again, was not made clear in what we are doing here for this podcast. Yeah, if you, stumble, <laughs> if you stumbled upon us, uh, you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to hear what happens. So, right. Up front, spoiler warning, a couple minutes in. Yep. And you're good. Uh, it's all good. Yeah. Carry on. You didn't say anything yet. You just set up the episode. Yep. Uh, Carry on. 
Da 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 da. So. So Kaz is supposed to fix this ship. Anytime anybody asks him to do anything, he's basically like, I'm a pilot. I don't do that. Uh, so again, that's something that happens multiple times. Uh, Ye- Yeager is talking to the owner of this ship. And um, there are some jokes about how professional his crew is and whatnot. And this guy is a uh, Nemoidian. And he's like, oh, you better not fuck my ship up. And like, I need it done quick. And I got a meeting and I'll be back. Uh, so, what's that guy's name? Hallian? Yes. Uh, Kaz does this thing with, I don't know, some control panel where he's like pumping feedback through the ship. I don't know. I don't really know what was going on with that. Um, but we do get a lot of like BB-8 and Kaz talking to each other. Uh, at this point, I think Yeager's like, hey, it's payday. Doles out everybody's gold bars that right. they get paid in and um but they have like the republic credit symbol on them it looked like yes they do something like that right yeah uh kaz does not get as much as he thinks that he deserves and uh so he talks to yeager separately and yeager's like yo man like you're just you're just fitting into this thing so just keep on going like you're not making a million bucks straight out and um i think Kaz brings up being a spy to him at this point i don't know Again, he does yeah it happens several times throughout this episode he's yeah. either talking to bb8 or he's talking to to yeager about it uh yeager yeah because he's like yeah, he's like, I don't even know why I'm fixing the ship. I need to be spying. Like, I'm, blah, a, blah, blah. I'm a spy. I should be doing spy stuff and spying on other spies and finding out what the spies are. Yeah, I'm like, why are you saying it so fucking much? He does say like, spy a lot. Uh, yeah. His behavior is also super suspicious. Yeager gives him this task of, he's like, all right, I got your first mission. And Kaz is like, yeah! Like, you know, fist pumping, and he's like, go get the fucking parts from acquisition. Here's money to pay for it. And then mm-hmm. we have this weird scene where Kaz is like sneaking around through this market. Because he wants to spy. He's like, well, I'll still try and get spy stuff done on the way to acquisitions. That's what he's telling BB-8 as they're as rolling he's around, sneaking around. So, right. So he comes across these uh, tusked fellows... I don't know exactly who they are, what species they are. Uh, At this point, he's confronted by Grevel, which is the little short-statured dude that he lost a bunch of money to last week via the dart contest. They take off running. Uh, We've got some dynamic chase music. Uh, He gets caught. He drops his trophy, which is apparently pure erodium Grevel tries to take it for the debt, um, which Kaz is not down with. So BB-8 saves the day by uh, shocking the one dude whose name I didn't write down. Gruel. Gruel, right? Gruel, yeah. And they're on, they're on the run again. Uh, they hide in a box, and this box gets dumped down a chute, which ends up in acquisitions, which is weird we can talk about that later like yeah it's convenient it, it is That's all i'll say about that right now convenient uh again conveniently he drops his trophy so flicks and orca they want to buy it and they're like wow this thing's worth worth some some coin bro you know <laughs> they don't they don't like, talk like that they don't say bro uh it's pretty close because orca definitely like reaches out for it and kaz tries to grab it and orca doesn't let go and he's like you know you could get a lot of because he's got like this i don't know like weird new yorkish bostonish so, accent that's the pig guy like, right yeah yeah it's like a weird kind of mix in between he's like you know like you it's it's worth a lot how how, how much do you want like yeah he says it's well. worth like you could live really well for months and uh, yeah he says i'm talking the best food the best rooms the best everything for a couple of months. <laughs> For a couple of months. But it right. has to be at least 1500 bucks because that's what he owes uh, Grevel. 
Gravel, yeah. Well, plus interest, Gravel says, so mm-hmm. two grand, maybe. Something um, like that. Yeah. So he's finally at the acquisition place, right, to pick up these parts, and um, what's her name? What is Tam. Name? Cam? Ham? Tam. T- T-A-M. Tam. Pa- Pam? Yeah. Are you saying Pam? Pam. 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 Slam. Slam. Tam. <laughs> Tam comes and gets him, and she's like, where the fuck you been? What's taking you so long? So they go back to uh, the Yeager Bay. Uh, Yeager lectures him about what he's actually there to do and how to do his shit properly and whatever. And uh, Kaz is supposed to install this compressor. He overhears Hallian talking to somebody about the Triple Dark, which... We don't find out what that is until a little bit later. Uh, Kaz and BB-8 discuss the trophy again. I guess he <laughs> like he gets sad or something. So when the workday's over, he like goes off to some random place and is hanging out. And then there's like some other dudes that come by and they say something about the triple dark. And he's like, I keep hearing this word. What does this mean? Why are you saying Martha? And... Uh, <laughs> The dude tells him what the triple dark is, and it's like a super bad storm or whatever, and pirates are known to to use the storm as cover to come in and rob the place, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it is to be noted that I did find out that the Colossus itself is a refueling station. Like, that's its purpose, and then all this other shit comes along with it, like the market and the races and uh, the bar and on. T, isn't that her name? Aunt T? Aunt Z. Aunt Z, yeah. yeah. And all the other shenanigans come with this refueling station. So I guess Yeager set up shop there like, hey, you need fuel? He's going to be the dude to fix your, fix your ship. Yes. Yeah, if other things need work. Uh, da, 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 da. So we find out what the triple dark is. Greville comes back, of course. Then we see pirates arriving. Greville's like, ah, shit, those are the pirates. It's the one guy. And uh, he tries to flee. Uh, we get some klaxons that, you know, alarms are sounding. Uh, there is a voiceover, not voiceover, an announcer, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Like, basically... Uh, we're going into lockdown, defense mode, whatever you want to say. All pilots to their ships, uh, pirates attack, beware, you know, whatever. Um, so we do have an aerial battle going on, and then we've got some shenanigans going on with Kaz and Greville. Uh, I wrote that they do have like this Indiana Jones door moment. After uh, a really, really, really unbelievable fall where they're, like, flung, they're, like, the ground is shot or something, and they, like, so, fly yeah, in the there's air and a... they land on a ship, mm-hmm. and then they fall off the ship back onto some boxes, and everybody is just, okay, hunky-dory, uh, and then all the while, like, these this door's closing, and I think BB-8, like, stops it from closing all the way, and then... Uh, well, because BB-8 at first is holding the door open. He has like his control port mm-hmm. in the door thingy. Yep. So he keeps it open. When the laser blast hits, they all lose their way or something like they that. They all go flying. But yeah, they all go flying. BB-8 included, I think, or something like. That. I or think so. Maybe He's maybe that not happens loose, later. At least. Yeah. Because when they do so land then, on the box, it's like. Um, Kaz jumps up and grabs BB-8 and then, like, hauls ass and jumps yeah. through the door. Like, the door is slowly shutting already by the time he, they're getting back. So, they, yeah, he tosses them in ju- and makes it in just just in time, sort of. Mm-hmm. And then like, Greville's like, hey, hold the door, hold the door, hold the door. And Kaz is like, I don't know how to hold the door. Like, I don't know what to do. I'm a pilot. Remember, I'm a pilot. I'm a pilot. <laughs> right. And uh, so he takes his, his lucky trophy and he jams it in the door. Mm-hmm. Uh, surprisingly, Greville can fit through this little space, and he basically says something to the effect of, like, oh, like, lucky for you. I'll ignore you for now, but I'm coming after you later, or something. So, um, 
this pirate fight is not going too good for the base. Seems to be going all right for the pirates, though. Uh, mm-hmm. And Kaz decides he needs to do something about it. So he comes up with this plan to take the little communicator that he had accidentally scared out of um, Hallian. Hallian's hand earlier. He's going to take that and he hooks it up to the to the feedback and the PA system. And then like that, I guess, transfers to the pirates so they can hear it. And it's like driving them nuts. So then they just give mm. up and they're like, ah, we can hear this feedback and it's bad. And there's people shooting <laughs> at us. Like, they're so mean. Like, let's get out of here. Uh, so they leave. And uh, the station lockdown ends. The Yeager's crew like comes up and Kaz is just like working on the fireball. And they're like, they all make fun of him because they're like, you're a little pansy boy that probably just ran away. And he's like, no, I'm not. Like, I'm check out what I did. And he like demonstrates that he did something to the ship, right? And then he's talking to Yeager about how Yeager was right. He needs to like balance being a spy and being undercover and being a, a uh, mechanic and whatever. Yeager's like, yep. All right, kid. Yeah. Whatever. See you later. At this point, I thought this was the end of the episode, but it's not. We actually, for some reason, we have one final scene where we cut to a first order star destroyer. Uh, The red trooper, that we saw last week, whose name I learned is Major Von Reg. Yep. Is talking to Craggle, the head of the pirates. That's right. Craggle, right? Craggin. Craggin. Craggle's the uh, thing from the Lego movie. That is correct. My N <laughs> looks like an L, so that will tell you how terrible my handwriting is. Uh, talking to Craggin. Von Reg is talking to Craggin. And they're talking about some arrangement that they had. It's not really clear. Phasma comes in and she basically expresses her displeasure. uh, And Kragen tells her the kind of what's up. Like, this is my pirate plan and uh, it's going to work. So, like, your peeps hired me to do something and just back off and give me some time and we'll get it done. This is the end of the episode. Uh we close on a, a nice close up of Phasma's helmet, not mm-hmm. her face, because you don't see her face. I wonder if you will nope. later in the series, but uh, I guess we'll find out. So or just ever, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see a little bit of it in the you last. You see like Jedi. her eye, yeah, just her eye, but not like a full face or anything. Definitely not. Yeah. So. Um, what did we decide? It's not Q Lab music. It's uh, it's a fanfare. Eleva- I guess elevate fanfare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, something commence fanfare. I guess commence yeah. fanfare. Commence fanfare. So, uh, yeah, that's what we got. I've got a list of yeah. one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven ish things that that uh, I thought we could dive a little deeper into. Um, Go for it. Starting with with our main protagonist, Kaz. Um, you brought up his age last week and how he acts pretty juvenile, but he should be older than that, right? Right. So I did a little bit of investigating, and uh-huh. I have found out that he is anywhere between, uh, you know, early teen to 29 years old. So the... <laughs> The that's quite the range. Well, <laughs> I say that because the only thing, uh, the only thing of record is that he was born after five BBY. Okay, and the Force Awakens takes place in thirty four. A it would be ABY, not BBY. Right, right. So after, yeah. so five years ABY or later is when he was born. Uh, the Force Awakens takes place. 34 ABY, so the max that he could be if this if this happened, if he was born at 5 ABY, and this happened immediately before The Force Awakens, 
then he would be 29 years old. I'm guessing he's closer to like his early 20s. Uh huh. But uh, we'll have to wait until. Which we is find... still annoying. Yeah. Yeah. He's. It's like, I don't know. He's only a couple years past high school, and I'm thinking maybe the academy is like high school age, not college age. Uh huh. Okay, that makes sense. So if you can take into account that the academy is high school ish, not post secondary education. Yeah, but he's still his characterization still bothers me though. Like, cause his his father still mentions that he went through marine training too. He's a marine, right? Or no. Mm. What's his pilot credentials? It got mentioned. I don't have my notes in front of me for last week's. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Uh, he went through some sort of th- like some the military academy. The academy. Well, I think that's what yeah. he's talking about. It's like the Republic Academy or whatever. Like I don't know. It's whatever Luke wanted to join back in the day. Right. But yeah, because his father mentions two separate like things, and I, I just don't recall. Yeah, off I thought top he my said head. like I, uh, you know, Navy? with my help, mm-hmm. you joined the Navy. Right, yeah, something like that, yeah. So that's so. where, like, he's a pilot in the Navy because they're ships, right? They're space yeah. ships, not space planes. So even right. though he's a pilot, not a captain, he... We just have to translate it in that, Navy like... Navy because, yeah, it's like a space yeah. fleet is a Navy unless it's mm-hmm. just a space fleet. Isn't that yeah, right? like space nautics, space force. I guess. That's what it is. <laughs> Something like that. So, yeah. So uh, it's like I won't. I only harp on the age thing just because of, like I said, his his characterization is so bizarre to me. So I I don't I can't I can't get a good read on his age. Right. It's totally valid. It's, it's like it's a reverse Tintin almost. Right, because like Tintin has the same thing where like he's kind of this. You you we never get Tintin's age, okay. like his drawings are anonymous or not an- anonymous isn't the right word, but um they're uh vague enough where like depending on the frame, mm-hmm. he looks like a ten year old boy, but in other frames he looks like a twenty year old, like man, right, a right. young man. Sometimes his manner of speech can be youngish, but he goes on these adventures where um, he holds his own, right? So then now we have a situation where we have a character that should be older in any case, but acts young, like whereas Tintin could be like the young kid, like young Indiana Jones on adventures, but... Yeah, he should... With just with his piloting credentials, he should have uh, a level of maturity that is not showing through in these two first two stories. Not at all. Yeah, and I mean, especially because like the way we get introduced to this dude is flying an X-wing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and not only and not only flying an X-wing, but he seems to be in charge of this mission. There are three people flying X-wings, and two of them, he's like, yeah. "No, you guys go." I will complete the mission. So in that instance, he is, he has grown enough to be able to, to know what needs to be done and take the sacrifice upon himself. Should a sacrifice need to be made and say, you, you guys got, you were my flight support. You got me here, but get out of here while you can. And I will do what I, you know, I will do my best to complete the mission. And then, and it was a mission where they gathered Intel for the resistance. Right. And then, you know, presumably not too long later, because the dude was unpacking his bag. Right? He was unpacking his bag today, so, I mean, he can't have been on the Colossus for too long. No. He's tiptoeing through a market and, like, popping up behind apple carts and shit and accidentally gropes a dude on the butt because, like, yeah, he's trying to be sneaky. 
But he's as sneaky as Kronk is in the Emperor's New Groove when he's singing his own theme song. <laughs> that is very true. And I will say that uh, the the music ditty throughout all this is like the like just this little delightful thing that I was this whole thing reminded me of uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. No. Yes. When they're in, when Indy and Marion are like in the marketplace Mm -hmm. and then Marion like gets in the basket, she's being carried around like that. It's just like this delightful little music thing that was going on. And that, and like the structure of this bizarre, bizarre and what is going on there. Like these two things, linked in my mind i i didn't see it while watching the episode but now that you mention it i i can make that correlation i definitely recall exactly what you're talking about for sure cool so my next thing is uh this little dude greville uh how long do you think this side plot is going to go on because this isn't a dude that's going to forget that that kaz owes him 1500 bucks but there's there's only two things that can happen one or I guess three. One, Gravel has to like leave uh leave Colossus. the classes. He forgets about it or he gets paid back. Or he dies, I guess, so four. Yeah. Like uh, I what I want is for this to not be a plot thread that continues. My gut feeling is that this is going to last at least half the season. Right. I think you're right. I think it'll last until we get to whatever it is that the season is actually building towards. Right. Yeah. And then, so, yeah, it'll be like some weird situation where, yeah, either Greville dies or um, Kaz, like, honorably pays him back. Or it'll be like one of these weird, uh, like reveals where, like Kaz helps out Greville and Greville's like helps him out more than he does in this episode, and then Greville like has a change of heart or something like that. Greville's right? like, "Hey, you saved my fucking life," you know, like that's the way he's acting. He's like, "Ah, hold the door, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna right. die," and then he but holds Greville the door. And he's like, "By the way, it. you still owe me money." Right. So there's going to be like some massive change of heart, I think, just knowing how these children's shows work and to some degree how Filoni likes to operate with these shows as well. Do you think somehow that uh, Greville will get called out for cheating on the bet? Because he took that dart and he totally crushed the flags on it and was like, yeah, use this one. Uh, Let's triple Uh, it. I feel like that's a forgotten detail. I don't. Not by this guy. Well, I mean, yeah, no, 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 not, not to, not from a viewer standpoint, from a writer standpoint. I feel like that's going to be a detail that totally gets missed. But okay, I would like to be proven wrong. You know. So next on my list is uh, discussing pirates. Right. Uh, this pirates plan is potentially problematic. <laughs> you like that? Uh, yeah. They fly in from somewhere under cover of weather, which doesn't really help them because as soon as they break the clouds, like the whole base goes on lockdown and then there's no cloud. There's no triple dark after that. Like, yeah, like the base itself isn't covered in clouds. It's just still weather above. Mm hmm. So, I mean... And I don't really know it, where they came from, and I guess they're stealing fuel? Maybe? Yes, there's a mention... No, there's a mention that they're there for the fuel. Uh, I forget who says that, but... um, Yeah, so somebody definitely mentions uh, when when they're going through where they're going, like, one of the pirates is like, okay, like, go attack that side and then grab the fuel. So is there, like, a new thing that happened that I don't realize, uh, like, in the fuel industry or something? Because we had 
The Last Jedi, where all the Resistance personnels... The Resistance was running out of fuel, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a contrivance for... To literally push the plot forward movement. Yeah. Right? Uh, So that, that was the catalyst for other things to happen. Solo coaxium same thing fuel like yep. it starts <laughs> it starts with you know it's a dark time and people are fighting over fuel fuel is a big deal and then we have this episode of resistance and the base is a fuel depot and we got pirates coming in to steal fuel is there so am i making more of a connection to these three things than than need than they deserve which i'll answer that one probably yes but like why all of a sudden do we have this focus on fuel in the star wars universe it's like somebody said we're like how are these ships powered like (laughs) you know you see a couple hoses hooked to the millennium falcon and like empire or something like that uh and i feel like some writer like got it stuck in their head like nope 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 like Nerds love their details. Like, we're going the fuel route, man. Like, everybody can deal with fuel. People hate fuel prices. Like, you know, maybe somebody that remembers, like, the the gas wars of the 70s or whatever, you know. I. Th- it does seem like one big coincidence to me, mm-hmm. you know, that there there is a lot of fuel talk in the Star Wars universe as of right now. I think also like as as a plot thread for a franchise overall that's that has a mind towards the international audience as well like it's yeah it's it's an easy plot point to kind of throw out and have everybody pick up right okay. that's that's the only thing I can think of I have you know that's just me spitballing and nobody's but. ever worried about food Except for Ezra and like that one episode where he needed to like go yeah. get Jogan fruit or whatever, right? But yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess they do worry about supplies, which presumably would include food on the Clone Wars. So I, yeah, I recant that statement. Yeah, but we don't get like a full like Aladdin situation where they might like starve or anything. Hey, you gotta eat, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. Curious coincidence for sure. Uh, moving on from pirates, the next thing that that I thought we could chit chat a little bit about is Yeager and uh, Tam Rivora. When it comes to how they deal with with Kaz, because Yeager is like he's totally in. He's got all the info. He knows this kid thinks he's going to be a spy, but. He needs to pretend to be a mechanic. And this has got to be frustrating for Yeager because, you know, everybody's like, why the fuck did you hire this kid? He's an idiot. Right. Like, he can't repair anything. There's a there's a line in this episode where Tam's like, well, if you don't need any help, like, realize which way your spanner is supposed to turn because, like, righty tighty lefty loosey and you're, you're going the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, she clearly is smells something is amiss because she calls him out for uh like where did you work before and he's all like he's not a good liar he's not good at improvisation he's not yeah. good at discretion he's not good at deceit like there's there's no reason that Poe Dameron should have been like hey you should be a spy right right yeah. he should be a pilot but not a spy. Yeah, find a pilot job. Because, yeah, it, to to detail uh, the the lie he tries to, or the cover he creates is, like, when Tam asks him where he goes to school, he just goes Coruscant, which would be, like, if you asked me where I went to school, I and I just give you um, United States. Yeah, America. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. You know, that doesn't mean shit. Um yeah, and she says, oh, are you telling us that you went to the mechanic school or mechanic university? Right. I think is what she calls it. And he's like, no, no, self-taught. 
which I was expecting this to turn into like a, ha, there is no mechanics university. You couldn't have gone there. But that's not the way they played it. No, because he goes self-taught and she goes, obviously, which I thought was a pretty wicked burn, honestly. <laughs> so Wicked smat. Uh, but what bothers me, too, is earlier in the episode, during one of those long uh, stretches where Kaz is angry that he's not – or no, he's – trying to spy while not letting anybody know he's spying so he like points at Hallie and is like maybe that guy could be a spy or uh that guy could work for the first order who knows uh and then Niku is like asking for a certain part to help fix the ship and he does not give him like the spanner that he asks for and fucking electrocutes Niku yep. who clearly is in pain like he's clearly been hurt um, my question, just to nitpick this too, was Yeager put him in charge of fixing Halion's ship. Why is then Kaz standing there handing tools to Niku? And not only did he put him and he put Kaz in charge of the repair of the ship, he says Niku will supervise. Right. So I dislike Niku... this on more than one level. Yes. Okay. Yeager is the boss. Yes. His job, of because he has th- three people working for him. Uh-huh. His job is to supervise these people. Yes. This is part of his job. So it should be, here's the job. You three people work on it. Each of you have your specialty. Tam, you're real good at this. Uh, Nico, you're real good at this, so that's what you guys are going to do. Keep an eye on the new guy for sure, but you're also working. Like, it's not, it, it's it's a weird setup. Right. And the fact that uh, they have this new client, and he's even like, hey, like, new client needs to be in and out, get it done quickly. And he's like, new guy that's clearly not a mechanic because he has told me a thousand times he's a pilot and he's a spy. Not a mechanic. You're in charge. <laughs> Right. So. And they're like on a time crunch and all this weird stuff. And then. I don't understand the time crunch either because. uh, So I get that this is a fueling station. And I don't understand what is wrong with this thing. Because it flew in under its own power. It didn't fly. It's not like it was on the top deck, got refueled, and they like towed it down there. Like, it just uh-huh. flies in from wherever the fuck the pirates came from and comes I... in and lands and, <laughs> like, there's Cause... a compressor that he needs to, Kaz needs to install. Right. But what is that? What does it do? Why is it needed? This thing seems to be operational. Yeah, I'm just going to shake my head through all of this because I have no clue either yeah the time crunch is only there because halion is trying to um get all the preparation again i don't know what halion's role is but he's he's the insider according to kragan oh yeah but then it's he he has some task to do before the triple dark storm sets in yeah is it that's the only real time crunch that i got out of this once the episode concluded yeah so. i maybe we'll see him in the future i don't know no oh, yeah the end of this episode did not look like a pleasant end for for hallion for mr hallion yeah i'm not really sure yeah. so yeah um lastly i wanted to talk about the first order a little bit uh this red dude is a major apparently major von reg yeah. uh I am quite intrigued by this character. I am also quite intrigued by uh, Phasma. I think that we're going to learn some more stuff about her. And I hope that she is a solid part of at least this first season. I can definitely see Gwendolyn Christie probably not wanting to, you know, potentially maybe she doesn't want to be a voice actor, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, she is she's lending her voice to to the show 
so far. So, I mean, I don't and, know. I guess we'll see. The same compliment that I had for Oscar Isaac last week, mm-hmm. I have for Gwendolyn Christie here as well. Like, she mm-hmm. she only has, like, a, a line, and it's not, it's not, like, a major thing. And with her character and who she is, you know, she's not going to obviously deliver as animated a vocal performance as Oscar Isaac gets to have with Poe. I think she nailed it, man. But, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Like, I think... Yeah. Even that, like she, there is no disconnect between what she sounds like uh, in the theatrical films versus what she does here, and I I appreciate that a lot. Like right, like that line from The Force Awakens, like FN two one eight seven, submit your blaster for inspection, like that, and whatever she says in this, which I don't remember, like right, I'm down, good, yeah, they. Yeah, like that's Phasma. Like there is no question about it. Whereas, you know, the way we pick apart Clone Wars and like how Mace Windu it doesn't quite sound like Mace Windu. Like, yeah. But um, no, having Gwendolyn Christie, she, yeah, she sounds like she's game for for this little vocal role that she yeah. has, at least in this little episode. She's Phasma. So, yeah, so I, I appreciate that greatly. Yeah. Awesome. It's, yeah. Yeah. What do you get? You got anything that uh, you wanted to bring up, cover? You kind of covered actually most of my things that I would have asked about. As You know, it's – my main thing is what the fuck is happening in this market with Kaz spying on people grocery shopping? <laughs> like, I just – that's yeah oh here's the thing i here's the thing i had I, that's right because like the way i wrote my notes it's like one big thing but i i really should just write questions at the end but um so kaz comes across these those two guys that initiate the fight in the market yeah with they're kaz. like the snaggle tooth guys right yeah the snaggle tooth guys and Kaz is just sitting up against a box, like overhearing the conversation while looking at BB-8 and talking to Mm BB-8. And then one of the guys goes, what are you looking at? And then Kaz is still just talking to BB-8. And then the guy goes, I said, what are you looking at? And then grabs Kaz and like is offended by Kaz's presence. But then I'm like, dude, he was... Looking at BB-8, I don't... What are you... He must have seen Kaz spying on him. I I guess, but when Kaz turns around to talk to BB-8, the conversation between the two Snaggletooths continues on. Mm-hmm. And you see it, right? It's not like you see them stop talking and one looks over as Kaz is turning away. Fair enough. Right, Fair that's enough. what bothered me because, like, then the camera angle changes so you only see Kaz and BB-8. Then you hear the voice without the directionality of who the line is being spoken to. Mm-hmm. And then when it's revealed that somebody's directing that sentiment towards Kaz, that's when I'm just like, "Dude, pick your words better" or something like that. Oh, like, okay, I got a question for you then. Right. Uh, yeah. He's talking to BB-8. Is he talking about these two guys? So Kaz is... Yeah, Kaz is talking about the guys. So I maybe believe. the guy can hear Kaz, and a more appropriate question would be, who you talking about? Right. I I wouldn't mind if it was... Even if it was just a simple, like, what are you doing here? Yeah, fair right? enough. Like, like kid, why are you why are you hiding behind this box over here? Like, looks mighty suspicious. Like, it could be literally anything else that isn't sight related, <laughs> and I would be fine. But the fact that you ask somebody that when Kaz is not actually talking or looking at this dude, I feel like it's like a line repeat where um, he's like. I feel like the dude says, who you looking at, or what are you looking at, and then he's actually talking to the other Snaggletooth guy or something, uh-huh. and that's when this whole thing starts, and 
that's when Kaz Kaz's attention is like brought to them and that's why he's like hiding behind a box. I don't know. He's not I a good know. he's not a good spy. No, not clearly not. The the best the best spying that he does, he does on accident when he's talking to Niku toward the beginning of the episode and he's like uh, have you ever seen a stormtrooper, Niku? Oh yeah. He's like, I saw one one time. What do you think they look like under their helmets? Like that. He's conversational, but he's also talking about the first order, and he's quizzing Niku because presumably whoever is the uh, sympathizer, shall we say, for the first mm-hmm. order, would have seen a stormtrooper or have had some type of contact with the first order. And so this is where he is spying at his best. And it's really when he's like, well, I wish I was a spy, but I have to be a stupid mechanic. Like, Oh, here's a tool. I don't know what it is. So. Yeah. Like you aren't a spy. If you're telling everybody you're a spy. Right. I was thinking of spying. I mean, flying. Right. <laughs> first order, I mean, for food. <laughs> first order, I mean, first order of lunch. Right. Is is going to be picked up? Is going to be on me. For pickup, yeah. a la carte. Like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, so those those were kind of my my questions about this episode. Um, so aside from thumbs up, thumbs down, I have one other question for you. And that is boil this episode down to one word. And, uh, what do you got? I will share mine. I said, this is very Jonesian. I got a, a wild Indiana Jones vibe from a lot of this. And it's like the sneaking through the marketplace and the thing with the door and the constantly like running from, Grevel, uh, like not anything that had to do with the triple dark, mm-hmm. but with all the uh, ancillary stuff is where yeah. I I made this Indiana Jones connection. So I'm going with Jonesian. I don't know about this one. <coughs> uh, like, uh, like this. This will be my word because it's how I'm thinking of the episode, but it's it's disjointed to me. Okay. There's a few there's a few threads that kind of happen that don't really seem to naturally progress into each other, especially with that convenient fall into Flix and Orca's shop. I cannot disagree with you. Right. You so, know, like uh, that, so as it being disjointed, that moves me on to, uh, your thumbs up, thumbs down rating. Uh, this one is a strong thumbs down for me. Very strong. I struggled with this one. I think I'm going to give it a thumbs up because it did have a bit of, of whimsy with it now. Whether or not the entire, whether or not the episode, I guess, quote unquote, makes sense. Uh, uh-huh. I think that there was an idea for this triple dark thing to, to, I think, I think the idea is there. I think the execution is not great. You know, if this episode was called uh, Spying on the Spy Spy, <laughs> like I think that. Don't you go running around the row row? <laughs> right. <laughs> you go run around the Roro. Yeah. So I think if it, you know, I think that change would have, uh, could have been beneficial. And because there's, there's not this triple dark lasts for three minutes at the end of the episode. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, even, even if I didn't know what the episode title was, which, you know, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't, right? Um, My my problem with this episode is that just the story doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't really matter, right? It, it's it, like not even. I'm not even saying that like each episode has to have some like 
overarching consequence on the Star Wars universe. That's not what I'm looking for. Just even amongst this, this show. show, right? Yeah, we'll have second to, episode in, and you've seen next week's episode, which is fuel for the fire. Yeah, I have not, so yeah. I don't know how this fits in with that, mm-hmm. and and yeah, I'm still not taking into account that at all. Like this is still just my feeling on this episode for sure on its own, but, or on its own in relation to the episode prior, right? Like, so the pilot sets up what we're here for. This episode really should carry on that mantle, but it doesn't because it gets distracted by this triple dark stuff. Right. Okay. So that's my problem with it. There, I, I'm, it's a strong thumbs down in terms of quality. I'm I'm not going to say I hated this episode by any means or anything like that. I wasn't bored, I guess would be the, the best thing I could say for sure. Right. But That's like your most same, positive thing. It's, right. I wasn't bored. I wasn't bored, but I also didn't care. Yeah. And for a show two episodes in, that's not good if I don't care, right? I mean, you and 330,000 other people. Right, but yeah, so like, clearly I'm going to keep watching this because it's Star Wars, and I'm clearly going to keep watching this because this is a thing that you and I are covering now, right? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. But I'm going to be honest, like, if we didn't have this podcast... You don't know that you would be. Right. Uh, Here's my take so far, is probably what I would do is wait until there was 10 or 15 episodes... You know, mm-hmm. say, wait until season one is out. Like, if this came, if this hit, uh, Disney streaming, like things hit Netflix, and I could right. sit down and watch the entire season, I probably mm-hmm. would. If I had to do this traditional television broadcast style, once a week for twenty two minutes, I probably would not. Right, and here here's the thing too. It's some sometimes I've given other programs like I think I've even done it with Clone Wars where you know understanding that it's geared towards a younger audience I'll 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 allow that you know like I'll I'll let some certain things slide yeah like stories aren't going to be dark there's going to be more of this light tone to it and that's fine right. but the story still needs to make sense now Somebody could easily just be like, well, this show is meant for kids and they're trying to appeal to kids. But the major example I can point out right now is that DuckTales, I watched on a weekly basis as the show was being released. And that grabbed me right away. Like the pilot was absolutely strong. It set up a structure. Hmm. The second, third, fourth episode in even though they were all standalone stories, there was, an, you know, an overarching arc that was clearly being built up. Right. Even with these individual adventures. And that's on Disney Channel as well. So it's, you know, you can't just say like, oh, it's for children, so they're going to do whatever and blah, 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 gags, all this stuff. You know, the, the other show that, I do watch, I'm not fully caught up on, but does a really good job at this as well as Tangled, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this The TV series, you know, that's another show that right off the bat, um, there's a few dead episodes here and there, but, you know, like there's, each episode has a story that's gripping and characters I care about, like Rapunzel and Eugene, right? Like, Yeah, I do wonder if this is a show that is going to... Uh, to grow on us or not. And I hope so. I mean, look at my, my turn on the Clone Wars. You know, I'm definitely giving more thumbs up for that show yeah, than I have. You're not quite to 50% yet. Uh, yeah. But it's, you know, the, the ship is turning there with how far we have gone on the Clone Wars. So, you know, and, and I'm not a 
I'm I'm always hopeful shows will be able to figure themselves out and turn around. And Agents of Shield took, I want to say, like a full twelve episodes before it finally turned a corner. And honestly, in that case, <laughs> uh, figured out what the hell that show wanted to be, right? But all the same, like at least with Agents of Shield, like the characters, I I I was down for and I understood who they were. I'm not gonna lie, Kaz annoys the shit out of me, and like I said last week, Niku is still my second least liked character in the Star Wars universe. Right. You know, like Niku's definitely lighter this episode because it all focus is thrown on Kaz. Well, yeah, that he's got like three lines in it, and that's it. Yeah, he's very he's very energetic. I liked how, like, when uh, when Kaz is unloading his stuff at the beginning, he comes up and he's like, wow, look at all of your belongings. That's just wonderful. Yeah, I the tone and the spirit that they struck with Niku this time was a lot better because he wasn't fucking shit up, right? Mm-hmm. This time it was definitely Kaz fucking shit up, and it made me um, sympathize with Niku a lot more, especially because... I I liked the way Niku was like, Kaz, is there a reason you didn't hand me the I forgot what the thing was. The Yeah, I thought I had it written down, but I can't find it. I feel like I said it earlier and I it's fucking gone from my head now. But the the spanner or whatever, mm-hmm. like like I'm asking you for the spanner and you handed me a thing that was not the spanner. Now I'm just trying to figure out is there a reason you handed me the not spanner when I asked for the spanner? Mm -hmm. Because you're a mechanic and you didn't hand me the spanner. I really liked that little exchange because it's basically Niku saying, what the fuck? It's a sub loop spanner. I got spanner at least. (laughs) Can you hand me the sub loop spanner? Because I asked you for the sub loop spanner and you did not give me the sub loop spanner. Yeah. Like, that's, like, as hearty of a fuck you as you're going to get so far in this show. <laughs> like, which... Yeah, it was it was enjoyable. Right. So, I, I did appreciate that little moment. Um, and, again, the same compliment as I had last week. And, you know, as the show goes on, I'm sure I, I'll stop mentioning. But the show's still fresh. But I, I really like the animation style still. Like, mm-hmm. it's... I really love this bright style. And when Niku gets electrocuted, even though this is supposed to be, like, the same universe as the live action shows Mm -hmm. there's a very cartoony moment of like niku floating in the air and statically like changing positions as he's getting electrocuted yeah being zapped yeah so i'm i'm all about a good zap gag like that you know so that that much i can compliment there as a whole you got you got story. some you got some silver linings in there, so that's right. That's a positive. So. Yeah, but on the whole, like this, nonetheless, yeah. I just this, sh- ugh, ugh, just frustrated with the show already, and we're just two in. So, well, maybe things will get better next week. I guess we'll find Hopefully. out. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, what is uh, next week's episode title? Is oh, I don't have it in front of me, but it's the. Something fuel related, I recall. Fuel for the fire, I believe is there what it is. There you go. Yep, fuel for the fire. Just found it. So, do you got anything else? Uh, anything else for for this week before we wrap up? Nope, that's kind of the big thing. Yeah, we mentioned Gwendolyn Christie making her appearance, yep. and yeah, so we'll we'll see what that's about. But um, yeah, it's again. Sorry, just that's that's part of my disjointedness is that in terms of how this show is going to build an arc it's really just a separate scene with its own fucking story happening yeah it was it was kind of the epilogue right so (laughs) yeah that's that's my problem with this thus far like there there are better ways to set up overarching villainy than literally setting up stuff that has like peripheral issues with our hero character our I, protagonist i do not disagree so so we're uh yeah. we're over an hour on this one so let's wrap this thing up and let these folks get back to their day indeed yeah 
You uh, <laughs> plug <laughs> uh, yeah, plug time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was headed towards, and then I was like, I my mind just lost itself. Lorenzo just uh, dropped the ball. Uh, oh. <laughs> we're on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, catch Lorenzo on Facebook at Not the Nerds Podcast. Catch Kevin on Twitter at Not the Nerds. Uh, we've got two shout outs that we do every episode to, uh, the wonderful Lindsay who put our jingle together. You can reach her via email at strange fantasy music at gmail.com. And you can find Kevin who, uh, put together our hero pose, uh, artwork for the podcast on Twitter at they call me K dub. So indeed, yes. We'll catch you next week for fuel for the fire. And uh, until then, these aren't the nerds you're looking for. Bye bye.